It is Friday, August 26th, one day until the kickoff of the college football season. You're watching right on Q College Sports. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome back. Thanks for checking us out again. I am your host, Tyson Quiller, and you are watching Red on Q College Sports. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share this content with anyone you think might find it interesting. As always, send me your feedback at Right on QCS on Twitter, right on QCS at gmail.com. Been getting some good feedback. I think the last three videos are now all up above 70 views. I wasn't really sure how the independent and uh, the other group of five conferences was going to do because there's probably not a huge fan base for a lot of those teams, but apparently BYU Notre Dame fans are limping us across the finish line with that one. Uh, but today we are going to be covering our final conference preview. And like I said before the Big Ten preview, grab your beer, grab your popcorn. We're going to be here a while. We are wrapping up this series uh, in the conference where college football reigns supreme and that is the Southeastern Conference. So without further ado, let's get after it. Now, Alabama has been the big dog, not only in the conference, but in the country for the last 13 years. Nick Saban and the Tide have won six national championships in that span and eight SEC championships. Teams have kind of risen to challenge, but all have really kind of failed to sustain that level, starting with LSU in 2007 and then in 2019. Auburn in 2013, and then Georgia in 2017 and last year. So, you know, the questions are, you know, is Georgia here to stay? Has the Bama dynasty begun to come to an end? Now, the SEC has had at least one team in the national championship game every year for the last seven seasons. Twice the championship game matched up two SEC teams. The SEC has been home to the national champion in five of the last seven seasons, and each of the last three by three different teams. Players from this conference won the Davy O'Brien Award, Butkus Award, Outland Trophy, Bednarik, Bronco Nagurski, and Heisman Trophy. I mean, there's just no question that this is the best conference in the country. Uh, college football is SEC. Now, with that being said, the SEC is very much top loaded. In the bowl season last year, you did have Georgia beat Michigan in the Orange Bowl and Alabama beat Cincinnati in the Cotton Bowl. However, Look at that top row of games there. Teams from this conference lost to a military academy, two group of five teams, and a team in Texas Tech who finished just seven and six and fired their head coach. The, the SEC finished the bowl season with a six and eight record, fourth worst amongst the 10 conferences. I, it just kind of puts a little perspective on the depth of the conference. Now, on the heels of an underwhelming 8-4 season in 2020, the Gators went just 6-7 and seven last year and fired their head coach, Dan Mullen. So begins the Billy Napier era in Gainesville. Now, Napier coached uh, the last three years at the artist formerly known as Louisiana Lafayette. They go by Louisiana now. Uh, he went 28-11 in that stretch. After going 7-7 seven and seven in his first season, the Raging Cajuns went 11-3, 10-1, and, and 13-1 and in his final three. Now, Louisiana plays in the Sun Belt Conference, and Napier has only beaten one ranked team in his career. That's number 23, Iowa State, in the COVID-shortened 2020 season. It's really kind of difficult to assess this hire because he's never really been tested at the level that the SEC is. Uh, and then, 
Of course, the biggest offseason move was LSU parting ways with Ed Ogeron, who won a national championship for them in 2019, just a couple of years ago. Uh, they ended up hiring Brian Kelly from Notre Dame to a 10-year, $95 million contract. In 11 years leading the Irish, Kelly had an 113-40 and record and has Notre Dame currently in a five-season double-digit win streak. Now, Kelly has made the college football playoff twice and the championship game once in 2012, but his overall bowl record is 7-5. and five. The SEC had the top three recruiting classes in the country, led by a historic haul by Texas A&M, signing eight five-star players. This was the first time the Aggies have ever cracked the top four, and it's really kind of sparked a ton of off-season drama. I can talk about it later. Uh, Nick Saban was not happy about this development. Alabama had the top class in two of the last three seasons and have had a top two class in each of the last four seasons. Saban and Jimbo Fisher have kind of gone back and forth with comments about NIL and paying players. Um, but like I said, we can talk about that a little bit later. Ultimately, though, a and signed four top 15 players in the country, eight top 25 players in the country, including two, number two quarterback and wide receiver, and the number one and three defensive linemen. Elsewhere in the SEC, LSU, Kentucky, and Missouri all had top 15 recruiting classes as well. Eli Drinkwitz pulling in the top 15 recruiting class at Missouri. How about that? Florida, Tennessee, and Auburn all had top 20 classes in the country as well. In all, the SEC had almost half of all of the top 20 recruiting classes in the country. Did I mention this is the best conference in the country? Now, in the transfer portal, several of these teams were very active as well. Ole Miss, LSU, Alabama, South Carolina, and Arkansas all had top 10 transfer portal classes in the country. South Carolina brought in Oklahoma transfer Spencer Rattler at quarterback and the stud tight end Austin Stogner as well as four-star wide receiver Antoine Wells from James Madison. Arkansas bolstered their defense, signing four-star linebacker Drew Sanders from Alabama, four-star safety Latavius Bernie uh, from Georgia, and four-star cornerback Dwight McLaughlin from LSU. The Tide picked up five four- or five-star transfers, headlined by five-star stud running back Yamir Gibbs from Georgia Tech, and the Georgia transfer wide receiver, Jermaine Burton. Now, LSU did lose their standout running back, Corey Kiner, to Cincinnati, but they signed two-year starting quarterback, Jaden Daniels, from Arizona State, and a couple of big pieces uh, picked up on the defense, headlined by a cornerback, Oklahoma State transfer, Jared Bernard, who had 51 tackles and 11 pass breakups for that very, very solid defense. Then the Bayou Bengals picked up four-star D-tackle, Makai Wingo from Missouri, and a four-star DB in Greg Brooks Jr. from Arkansas. LSU really did make a lot of moves in the portal, uh, you know, but they did have the coaching change. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out for them. But the true winner of the portal in this conference, second nationally only to USC, is the Ole Miss Rebels. Big pickups on offense were five-star quarterback Jackson Dart to replace Matt Corral, two 600-yard rushers in Zach Evans from TCU, and Ulysses Bentley from SMU, and two four-star tight ends, Michael Trigg from USC and J.J. Peguis from Auburn. The Rebels won big, two on the defensive side of the ball, signing four-star linebacker Troy Brown from Central Michigan, four-star edge Jared Ivey from Georgia Tech, and a four-star safety, Ladarius Tennyson from Auburn. Now let's talk about some players to watch heading into the 2022 season. This conversation really starts with Bryce Young, the returning Heisman Trophy winner. He is currently the second best odds to win the Heisman in Vegas at plus 350. Uh, the Alabama quarterback was second in the nation last year, passing for 4,872 yards and 47 touchdowns to just seven interceptions in their four biggest regular season games versus Miami, number 11, Florida, number 12, Ole Miss, and number one, Georgia. He threw for 1,246 yards, 12 touchdowns, and just one interception. They won all four, by the way. That This dude plays big in the clutch. Now, there's a lot of hype surrounding Anthony Richardson, uh, the quarterback at Florida, and he is a real dual threat stud rushing over 400 yards last season, but he saw a limited action due to a bad knee injury that required surgery, and, and when he was contained in the pocket, he struggled. 
to six touchdown passes to five interceptions. He currently, for whatever reason, has the second best odds in the conference to win the Heisman, but I, I don't see it. Now, the quarterback that I do think is underrated that could have a real breakout season this year is Tennessee's Hendon Hooker. Assuming he wins kind of a moderate quarterback battle with the former Michigan Wolverine quarterback and last year's early season starter Joe Milton and the four-star recruit Taven Jackson, Hooker will have a ton of talent around him in Cedric Tillman and the USC transfer Brew McCoy. He played very well once he was kind of given a chance last year. In addition to running for 620 yards, what is probably the most impressive thing about Hooker is that he threw 31 touchdowns to three interceptions. That is incredible. He's currently at plus 5,000 to win the Heisman. I think I'll probably be putting some money on that. Now, the most popular candidate for Doak Walker from the conference has been Alabama's transfer running back, Yamir Gibbs. I already mentioned his name. He had 746 rushing yards, 470 yards receiving out of the backfield last year at Georgia Tech. Uh, but the SEC's second leading rusher from last year is back as well in Chris Rodriguez at Kentucky. He rushed for almost 1,400 yards, leading Kentucky to a 10-win season. Rodriguez rushed for over 100 yards in each game of their last five games, including at uh, in the bowl game, number 15, Iowa. Now, the top four receivers in the SEC last year, Jamison Williams, Wondell Robinson, John Mechie, and Traylon Burks, all went pro. The top returning receiver this, in this conference this year, though, is Cedric Tillman from Tennessee. He had almost 1,100 yards, 12 touchdowns receiving last year. He's a real deep threat option. He averages about 17 yards per catch. Uh, Tillman is Tennessee's only returning receiver to have more than 200 yards last year. So, you know, you know Hendon Hooker is going to be targeting him a lot. On the defensive side of the ball, the reigning Bronco Nagurski Award winner, Will Anderson, is back at linebacker for the Tide. Anderson has had 41 and a half tackles for loss and 24 and a half sacks in the 28 games he has played in Tuscaloosa. Last year alone, he collected 17 and a half sacks, which was most in the country by two. This is your most likely candidate to have as Defensive Player of the Year in New York for the Heisman at the end of the season. He currently has the 14th best odds of any player in the country for the Heisman. Now, Anderson's teammate, Henry Totoa, is also back in the linebacking core for the Tide as well. He had 111 tackles, four sacks last year. Now, Tennessee linebacker Jeremy Banks returns after having 128 tackles, five and a half sacks last year. And another outstanding linebacker in this uh, SEC is Arkansas's bumper pool, who led the conference in tackles for much of the year last year, finishing with 125 on the season. Auburn's Derek Hall is probably the most dangerous D lineman returning in this conference. He had nine sacks, two forced fumbles, and 52 total tackles last season. He will be anchoring an otherwise pretty inexperienced D line. Uh, so he'll need to kind of be big for them if they're going to get pressure on the quarterback. With 15 Georgia Bulldogs drafted in the NFL, eight were on the defensive side of the ball. That makes for a complete overhaul of this unit. But that means it is now Jalen Carter's turn. He had 37 tackles, three sacks in limited action last year. Uh, but he is a tremendous talent. So keep your eyes peeled on the 6'3", 310 sophomore. In the secondary, Cam Smith at South Carolina is an absolute ball hawk. He had 11 pass breakups and three interceptions last year. With transfer, Devonnie Reed added the Gamecocks secondary is going to be probably pretty solid. Missouri sophomore Jalen Carlis had a huge breakout freshman season with 67 tackles, four interceptions. Look for him to anchor the Tigers defense. That's going to be a little weaker up front, leading to more tackles on the second level. Okay, so let's get to our team talent previews here out of the Southeastern Conference. And we'll start right here in the East Division. Obviously, reigning national champion Georgia Bulldogs I have as the best team in the East. Uh, as always, second column is the power ranking. Third column is their record from last year. Uh, Georgia, I have the only team, only behind one team, Ohio State. Then you can see it drops off quite a bit down to Tennessee at 21. Florida Gators just on the outside looking into the top 25. Kentucky, we're going to talk about some updated news for them. 
uh, that have dropped their talent ranking a bit. Then South Carolina and Missouri's quite a bit of a drop off. And then Vanderbilt is absolutely in complete disarray. So let's start with Georgia. The former walk-on Stetson Bennett is returning at quarterback. He had 29 touchdowns to just seven interceptions last year, which, you know, I mean, I mean, I guess that's kind of pretty average, but he also did run for 259 yards. After throwing two interceptions versus Alabama in the SEC championship game, he threw for 537 yards on 66% passing and had five touchdowns to zero interceptions in their two playoff games, uh, leading the Dogs to their first national title since 1980. Herschel Walker, anybody? Now, star wide receiver Jermaine Burton transferred to Alabama. Zamir White and James Cook both got drafted at the running back position, but this team does still somehow return 73% of their offense. Kenny McIntosh will now take the mantle at running back. He's a senior who had 348 yards, three touchdowns last year, and 242 yards, two touchdowns receiving. He's a decent weapon out of the backfield. Uh, seems capable to me, especially behind an O-line that returns three starters. Three sophomores on the left side could pose a bit of a problem, but you know they've been recruiting uh, the cream of the crop. But the Dogs did get five of their top seven receivers back from last season, led by Brock Bowers and Ladd McConkey, who both had outstanding freshman campaigns, uh, combining for 1,329 yards and 18 touchdowns. Both had a rushing touchdown as well, by the way. This offense is certainly limited in some ways, but without a doubt, this is a top 25 offense in the country. The 2021 Georgia Bulldogs broke the record for most players drafted from one team into the NFL, 15 players taken overall. Eight of those players were on the defense. Five of them were first-round picks. This Georgia Bulldogs defense is going to be completely overhauled. However, you know the old adage, reload rather than rebuild. The Dogs have signed at least two five-star defensive players in each of the last three recruiting cycles. They'll be young, but crazy talented. One of those five-star defenders is Jalen Carter, I mentioned just a moment ago. In limited playtime, Carter had 37 tackles, three sacks last year. I think he's a real preseason candidate for Defensive Player of the Year in the SEC at the tackle. The D-line is going to be solid, and behind them, Nolan Smith headlines the linebacking core. Smith had 55 tackles, three and a half sacks, and three forced fumbles in 2021. But in a conference that is going to be passing the ball a lot, I'm really looking forward to watching this star-studded secondary. Returning safety Christopher Smith had three interceptions last year, including that pick six against Clemson in the opening week weekend. Uh, Five-star corner Keely Ringo is back for his sophomore campaign. He had two interceptions and eight pass breakups. The only question is Tyke Smith. Hasn't had very much play time. This is still a top 10 unit, but I don't think as dominant as a year ago. Now Georgia kicks things off in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz stadium against a completely revamped Oregon Ducks squad. Now the quarter, new quarterback for the Ducks is Bo Nix. He has played the Dogs many times, so he may give them a chance, but ultimately Georgia pulls away in the second half and I think probably wins by two or maybe even three touchdowns. Uh, at South Carolina, it might be a trap game week three. That is always kind of harder than it has to be for the Dogs. This is really a pretty easy schedule though. They get Florida and a very good Tennessee team back-to-back -back at the end of October. But, I mean, they're going to have both at home. If Georgia does lose a game, I think it'll probably be Tennessee at home or at Kentucky. Now, that Tennessee ball squad. It's year two under Josh Heupel, and I really think this program is headed in the right direction. You may not think so looking at their 7-6 and six record from last year, but four of those losses last year were to top 15 teams in the country. And the other two were to the ACC champion, Pitt Panthers, and their bowl game against one of the hottest teams in the country at the time in Purdue. Now, in 2022, all 22 starters on this team are upperclassmen. This offense returns eight starters. At quarterback, my dude I was just talking about, Hendon Hooker, is back. And he is an under-the-radar real contender for Offensive Player of the Year in the SEC. Hooker, the former Virginia Tech transfer, started 12 games last season throwing for almost 3,000 yards and 31 touchdowns. But check this out, only three interceptions. He tied C.J. Stroud for the second-best passer rating in the country at 182.2 in 2021. Oh, yeah, he's mobile, too. He ran for 620 yards, 
five touchdowns as well. He enters the season as the fifth best Heisman odds, according to Vegas Insider. In the backfield with Hooker, the Vols' leading rusher from last year, Jabari Small, is back. In front of him is you know a pretty serviceable O-line, three returning starters. Right tackle Darnell Wright is a second-team all-conference selection. Now, Small was really not used as much in the passing game last year. I think they really need to incorporate him into that phase better uh, if they're going to take the next step this year. Now, speaking of the passing game, Tennessee returns a ton of talent at the skill position. This group is headlined by first-team All-SEC Cedric Tillman at the X wideout. He had over 1,000 yards receiving 12 touchdowns last year. Elsewhere, Jalen Hyatt and Ramel Keaton will round out this group. Both had kind of limited play time, but both were highly rated four-star recruits out of high school. A ton of top-end talent between them. Now, over on the defense, Tennessee's two leading tacklers are both back in the linebacking group. Jeremy Banks, a dude I talked about a moment ago as well, and Aaron Beasley, they combined for 202 tackles and seven sacks last year and head up a very experienced and talented front six for this nickel defense. In front of them, you have three new starters, but 6'4", 320, D-tackle, Omari Thomas, and 6'5", 260, D-end, Tyler Barron. Both played every game last year. Oh, and by the way, you have first-team all-SEC selection in Leo Edge, Byron Young, who accounted for five and a half sacks in 2021. Now, the secondary group, though, was pretty bad last year, giving up 233 yards passing per game. That was 122nd in the country. There will be three new starters in this group in 2022, so this is definitely the main liability for the balls this year. You do have one future pro in Trayvon Flowers who had 84 tackles, two interceptions, but there's <clears throat> kind of quite a bit of uncertainty elsewhere. I really do think these balls will be much better than we were accustomed to seeing in the last decade, uh, but this is a top 10 difficulty schedule in the country. You know, by this point, I'm very high on Pittsburgh. I don't think Tennessee will win that one, uh, but they should be 4-1 and one when they host Alabama on October 15th. <clears throat> that will be one week after an emotional big get-up revenge spot against A&M for the Tide. I could possibly see a letdown if Tennessee sneaks up and gets them there. Um, they won't be Georgia, but you get Kentucky at home, and the rest are very winnable. I mean, 8-4 and four, up to maybe even 10-2 and two for these guys. Well, so begins the Billy Napier era in Gainesville. Starting quarterback Anthony Richardson, or AR-15 as the cool kids say, enters the 2022 season with the fourth best Heisman odds of any player in the SEC at plus 5,000. He is certainly capable of being a stud, but in the two games he started last year, at LSU and at home versus Georgia, he threw for just 249 yards, three touchdowns to four interceptions on 56% completion percentage. I mean, that really doesn't strike me as wildly impressive. If you've seen him throw, you know, he kind of has this sidearm thing that just, it just looks risky. Now, he did have 401 yards rushing, but he is just now kind of beginning to practice without a brace from his knee surgery. I'm on kind of full-on pump the brakes with this analysis right now on, on AR-15. Now, coming off of an outstanding freshman season, Montreal Johnson has followed his coach, Billy Napier, from Louisiana to Florida. Johnson had 838 yards rushing and 12 touchdowns in 2021. He will be a key piece for the Skaters' offense this year. Um, they do have an all-upperclassman O-line in front of him, led by first-team All-SEC right guard Osiris Torrance. Now, in the wideout group, there aren't really any weapons, but the trio of Shorter, Henderson, and Whitmore are probably serviceable if Richardson can get them the ball. Now, the Gators' defense returns eight starters. That's tied for the most in the conference, but those eight starters accounted for just 58% of the defensive production last year. The biggest hole is up front with the team's leading tackler, linebacker, Mohamud Diabate, transferring to Utah this offseason. Uh, but they return a few nice pieces. Uh, German Dexter at D-Tackle is a second-team all-conference selection, and he's joined by two upperclassmen returning starters as well. In a serviceable linebacker group, Brenton Cox at Jack was also a second-team pick, and Ventrell Miller has a ton of upside. The secondary is a little more hit or miss, though. Trey Dean and Rashad Torrance at Strong Safety and Free Safety are both returning starters and caused five turnovers last season. 
But you have two new starters at each corner. One of them is a freshman and the other a sophomore. I think it could get a little dicey. Man, I hope Napier has these boys ready because this schedule comes right out of the gate swinging. I'd be surprised if the Gators beat Utah. But this is a depleted Kentucky squad in week two, and you and you have them at home. Now, Florida, they're going to lose at Tennessee to Georgia at Texas A&M. Uh, but the rest are, are winnable, possibly. I mean, I really think, even though this is a very tough schedule, eight and four is doable. Speaking of Kentucky, so the biggest hole is the Nebraska transfer and Wildcats leading receiver from last year, Wandale Robinson. He had 700 more yards than the next closest receiver on this squad. But your quarterback is back, and Will Levis, who really did some damage on the ground rushing, nine touchdowns in 2021. Uh, Kentucky brought in two wide receivers from the transfer portal, and Tavion Robinson from Virginia Tech, and Javon Baker from Alabama to bolster that position group. Uh, but Baker has since decommitted and is headed to Central Florida. Now, conventional wisdom was that they would lean more heavily on the run this season, because when they did pass, uh, when they were pressed into passing last year, Levis had 13 interceptions. You know, I, I don't really get why he's being discussed now as like a top-tier NFL caliber guy. I, I, it was all hype at Penn State. It's all hype at Kentucky now. I mean, um, but anyways, so now things were looking good in the run game, though. The Wildcats were bringing back the second leading rusher in the SEC from last season, Chris Rodriguez Jr., behind a big athletic O-line starting four upperclassmen. But here's the news that made me have to adjust their talent ranking, their power ranking. Rodriguez has been removed from the death chart since he was arrested for a DUI last month. There's really no word about whether he'll play this year. Stoops like refuses to comment on the status of Rodriguez. So we kind of have to treat this as if he's been removed from the team. Uh, but if this team can establish the run, and obviously getting Rodriguez back would go a long way towards that. I think they're going to be very tough in the running game, at least, to stop. Now, this defense returns 72% of their production. They were top 20 in the country last year in rushing defense, allowing just 121 yards per game. This forced teams to pass, and when they did, the Wildcats collected nine interceptions. This defense is kind of built front to back, a very strong D-line, headlined by junior nose tackle Justin Rogers. Behind him is a very deep linebacking core, Jack linebacker DeAndre Square had 81 tackles, three sacks, and an interception in 2021. You have returning starting uh, middle linebacker in Jaquez Jones, who had 82 tackles of his own. In the secondary, Ole Miss transfer Kedron joins probably the second and third best defensive backs from the team a year ago in Terrell Ajane and Carrington Valentine, who are both kind of impressive open field tacklers, a, a lot high number of tackles for players in the secondary. But you're starting a freshman at nickel, only five returning starters. This group is a bit suspect. Like I said, I did have Kentucky ahead of Florida initially, uh, but this was this news about Rodriguez. Man, I mean, that really devastates this offense. I do still have them as a very fringe kind of top 25 team, though. That we that week two game at Florida is going to determine probably who finishes third in this division. Uh, they did beat the Gators at home by seven last year in a game that Levis threw for just 87 yards. So don't underestimate Mark Stoops' ability to muddy things up and get creative. There's at least four losses here, and Louisville is much improved in that final game. They finished 10-3 and three last year. This year, probably more like 7-5, and 8-4. and four. Now on to the South Carolina Gamecocks, and hey man, Shane Beamer did an incredible job getting the boys to a bowl game last year, and they won it. Carolina started four different quarterbacks in 2021, one of which was a grad assistant coach who had to be added to the roster after your two starting quarterbacks went down with injuries. <clears throat> so unlike my Colorado Buffaloes, Beamer went out and actually improved the quarterback room in the offseason, bringing in Oklahoma transfer embattled quarterback Spencer Rattler. Now, I say embattled because, I mean, he was a five-star recruit out of high school uh, to OU, and he threw for 3,000 yards, 28 touchdowns in 2020. But last year, he was pulled midway through the season in the Texas game for Caleb Williams. To that point, against teams not named West, Western Carolina, he had thrown five touchdowns to five interceptions. So he's kind of looking to reinvent himself in Columbia. 
and so too is transfer tight end Austin Stogner that I mentioned earlier. But he looks like he's listed as backing up junior Jaheim Bell. Bell did have almost 500 yards and five touchdowns last season, but I'm sure Stogner thought when he transferred that he'd be getting the nod to be the starter there. Their leading receiver from a year ago is back in Josh Van. The new piece in this group is Xavier Leggett, who has had very limited playtime in his career. And your leading returning rusher, Marshawn Lloyd, had just 228 yards on the ground a year ago. This offseason has a lot of work to do to get ready for Arkansas Week 2. Now, this defense is certainly the more proven unit, but they return just 65%. You have a few nice pieces in second-team all-conference D-tackle Zach Pickens, who had four sacks, and second-team all-conference defensive back Cam Smith, who I mentioned earlier, 11 pass breakups, three interceptions uh, in 2021. The Gamecocks were 41st in the country in total defense, but 107th in red, red zone efficiency. That must improve if they want to go bowling this year. Now, I know that Shane Beamer and the additions of Rattler and Stogner have a lot of excitement growing in Columbia, but I mean, this is also just an absolutely brutal schedule. At Arkansas and the hosting the reigning national champs in week two and three, then two weeks later at Kentucky and hosting A&M, you finish at Florida, Tennessee at home, and then at Clemson. Yikes, man. I mean, this is the third toughest schedule in the country. I really think I only see five wins here. Now on to Missouri, and the Tigers went 6-6 six and six in the regular season in 2021 and then lost the Armed Forces Bowl to Army. Starting quarterback from 2020 and 2021, Connor Bazelak, has transferred out to Indiana. So Missouri's going to turn to a sophomore, Brady Cook. Cook was just a three-star recruit and has had real limited playtime thus far. He does seem a little bit mobile, kind of a dual threat of sorts, but I think he's going to be a real problem for Missouri. They really needed to make some moves like my Colorado Buffaloes at quarterback. 1,600-yard first-team all-SEC running back Tyler Batty has gone pro. And check this out. No other player ran for more than 170 yards all of last year for the Tigers. So, I mean, that cupboard is completely bare. At whiteout, you're starting two sophomores and a freshman. I think this offense is really going to struggle. Now, Missouri was 105th in the nation in total defense a year ago. They did pick up three transfers to bolster an experience, but kind of lacking in talent unit. Joseph Charleston, the defensive back from Clemson, was probably the biggest of these pickups, but this defense is really going to struggle as well. So these Tigers are much less talented than South Carolina, but they may have a better chance to make a bowl game just simply because of their schedule. At Kansas State, Week 2 is going to be important. If they lose that, they ain't making a bowl game. Uh, But New Mexico State, Vanderbilt, Abilene Christian, Louisiana Tech, all at home. That's four wins right there. I'll say five and seven here as well. And now the Vanderbilt Commodores. Now, you might guess, but the cupboard here is very bare. Vandy doesn't have a single player on first, second, or third team All-SEC. The quarterback, Mike Wright, took over the starting role after their Week 4 loss to Florida in 2021. He is kind of an electric runner, uh, but he is just bad in the passing game. He had eight touchdowns to six interceptions on just 53% completion percentage. This offense will be starting three true freshmen, two of them on the O-line, but they do return 70% of their production, whatever production that they had from last year. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see if they've improved on that in the offseason. Now, this defense was just terrible last season. As Vanderbilt went 2-10 in 2021, this defense gave up over just over 35 points per game. They particularly struggled defending the run, giving up almost 200 yards per game on the ground. But they returned just over 67%, and the Commodores brought in former four-star Clemson transfer Kane Patterson at linebacker. Now, he must have transferred for academics, right? But, I mean, he's he's probably the best player Vandy's had in in maybe a decade. But how much of an impact can he make on this unit? I mean, we will see, obviously, in years past, it's been more than just a lack of talent thing at Vanderbilt. It's been a culture thing. Uh, They are going to be starting a freshman at corner as well, though. Now, Vandy won at Colorado State to start the season last year. Can they do the same thing at 
at a very depleted Hawaii squad this year? I, I think so. I think so. Um, but I have Northern Illinois winning the MAC, so Vandy will lose there. I think this is the second toughest schedule in the country. I, I don't see them winning again after Elon two and ten again for Vandy. Now let's hop over to the West Division as we continue to crank along through our te team previews. And you can see here, I have two teams out of the West Division in the top 10. Ole Miss just on the outside looking in. Four teams out of this division in the top 25. Um, but I am down quite a bit on LSU and Auburn. But let's start right here. Alabama, Crimson Tide. Listen, Bryce Young enters this season with the second best odds to win the Heisman. Could he become just the second player ever to win two Heisman trophies, joining Archie Griffin, who pulled that off in 74 and 75? Uh, I think no, uh, but I, but mostly the reason I say no is I think the voters wouldn't do it. You also have Will Anderson on the defense who they might pull votes away from each other. Um, but anyways, back to Bryce Young. Young threw for almost 4,900 yards and 47 touchdowns on his way to winning the Heisman last year. This roster is just littered with talent, so I'll just try and focus on a few guys that I think will be a big impact for them this year. This dude on your screen right now flies under the radar quite a bit, but at 6'5", 244, tight end Cameron Latou, I think will be very clutch in the red zone passing game. He had 410 yards and eight big touchdowns in 2021. Now, as I mentioned, Yamir Gibbs transferring uh, transfers in at running back and Jermaine Burton at wideout. Both were top-tier transfers. Now, Bama had the seventh-best total offense in the nation last year, and, I mean, I, th I think they've gotten better, quite frankly. Now, flipping over to the defense, with the fourth best odds to win the Heisman Trophy, the dude I just mentioned, linebacker Will Anderson, is back after collecting 101 tackles. And stand by, wait for it, 17 and a half sacks a year ago. Next to him in the linebacking group is another dude that we previewed earlier, returning leading tackler from last year, Henry Toa Toa, who had 111 tackles and four sacks to his name. Now, the tight have eight returning starters on this defense that was fourth in the nation against the run, holding opponents to just 86 yards per game. In the secondary, they did give up 218 yards per game passing, though. This is probably the one weakness for the Tide in 2022. Now, DeMarco Helms and Jordan Battle are returning starters at strong and free safety. Both of them, each of them came up with three interceptions in 2021. And Alabama brought in LSU transfer Eli Ricks to bolster this group as well. There's a ton of talent. Your three big men up front are ranked as the third best group of defensive linemen in the country, according to College Football News. E.B. Ogby, Dale, and Young are extremely athletic for how large they are. There's a popular sentiment that after Clemson blew out Alabama for the championship in 2018, Nick Saban made like a tectonic shift in the roster building. Uh, the Alabama of old winning three of four championships from 2009 to 2012, was always kind of defined by defense. You know, top five units in the country on defense with a serviceable offense. Uh, your modern-day tight squad is kind of the opposite, high-flying offense. Uh, and they still have very good defense, but they're now willing to sacrifice, making them face more possessions per game to put more points on the board. Now, I don't know if they really had to do that, but it's, it's hard to argue with the results. So Nick Saban just signed a contract extension through 2030. He is again the highest played coach in college football. And taking a look at the schedule, you know, there's a lot of hype around the Texas game, but they ain't, they ain't there yet. Big win for Alabama in that one. This really isn't that tough of a schedule. The three game set, Arkansas, Texas A&M, and at Tennessee is the meat of the schedule. I could, I could maybe see them drop one of those. Like I said, a possible loss at Tennessee after A&M. But 11-1 is my call for the Tide in 2022. Now on to Texas A&M. And the Aggies, I told you I'd get back to this. The Aggies are riding high, fresh off of a record-breaking best recruiting class in the nation in 2022. Now there's been a lot of back and forth between Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban and, and in the news this offseason. But, I mean, it's all noise, right? I mean, I, I, this stuff I can't stand. This clutching of pearls. Oh, my gosh. Jimbo Fisher bought the best recruiting class. Yeah, so what? I mean, are we supposed to act like Alabama hasn't been paying players for years already? I mean, come on. How naive do you think we are? 
And as far as Nick Saban, I mean, you win a national title like every other year. You're the highest paid coach in football. You're unanimously believed to be the best coach in college football history. Like nobody feels sorry for you because somebody might be able to compete recruiting now. Like, well, so anyways, I digress from that. Um, there was a heated battle between LSU transfer Max Johnson and the sophomore Haynes King um, at, at quarterback, and Fisher just announced that King won the job. Neither of those two are really all that impressive to me, uh, but this team is built a lot like the old Alabama teams that I was just talking about. The quarterback just really needs to kind of be serviceable and not turn the ball over, because behind him is Devin A. Chain, who had almost 1,000 yards, nine touchdowns, rushing last season. And that was splitting reps with Isaiah Spiller. I mean, look for him to explode this season. He's like a seven-yard per carry in the last two years and second-team All-SEC selection. On the O-line, right guard Layden Robinson received second-team All-Conference honors as well. But this is a very young offense, starting four sophomores and two freshmen. Uh, but, man, are they talented. These Aggies have signed nine five-star players and 35 four-star players in the last two seasons. At wideout, Anaya Smith is a real explosive weapon. If the quarterback can get the ball out to him, uh, he, he can really make some things happen in the open field. And then you have, obviously, Evan Stewart joins him. Uh, he is a freshman, but he's the number two wide receiver recruit in the nation. The weapons are there. You know, can, can they mature? Can they communicate? Can King get them the ball? Those are kind of the questions. Now, on the defense, the big losses were on the D-line, D-tackle to Marvin Leal and your defensive end, Tyree Johnson, who both went pro. They combined for 17 sacks a year ago. Uh, but this defense faces a similar situation to the offense. I mean, they're, they're going to be starting five sophomores and a freshman, but they're all high four- or five-star dudes. I mean, nose tackle McKinley Jackson was selected to the third-team All-SEC, and to his outside on either side, you have – Shamar Turner and Adelaide Tunmais, who were both top 10 D linemen in their recruiting class uh, two years ago. This defense took a bit of a step back last year after an incredible 2020 campaign. I credit most of that to youth, but I mean, they were still a top 20 team against the pass. At nickel, the Aggies returned their second leading tackler from last season in Antonio Johnson and their third leading tackler in Damani Richardson at safety. The secondary should be a very solid group. Now, this team with the last two recruiting classes is really probably your best bet right now for the 2023 national championship, uh, but this is 2022. AM did have one first team all SEC selection, their punter, Nick, Con Nick Constantino. Uh, the Aggies were 11th in the nation in net punt, net punt yards. That can really flip the field in a close game uh, and make a difference, maybe. I, you know, so I think. Um, I think he could be a weapon, maybe in the Alabama game, right? Um, looking at the schedule, though, the three-game stretch from September 10th to the 14th is going to show us a lot about this young group. App State is really kind of a trap game. Uh, could they round into shape and contend at Alabama? Uh, I, don't, I don't know about all that. I mean, I, I would say I would give A&M 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 10 and 2, and then let's go ahead and let's move on to the Ole Miss Rebels. Year three for Lane Kiffin, and they lost their stud quarterback, Matt Corral, to the NFL. Well, the Rebs hit the transfer portal hard. As a part of their second-ranked class in the nation, they secured USC transfer Jackson Dart, who's a high-level four-star recruit. And his four starts last season, he twice passed for over 300 yards, including a 391-yard game in a win at Washington State. Again, similar here, there was a, a brief quarterback comp, uh, competition uh, with Luke Altmeyer, but Dart won the job, and so that's pretty well set. Now, like AM, there are a lot of new pieces on this offense, including three new starters on the O-line, but they just have weapons everywhere. Wide receiver Jonathan Mingo is a second-team All-SEC. Your, your two other wideouts transferred in. Malik Heath had 444 yards and five touchdowns at Mississippi State in 2021. And Jalen Robinson, who went for 979 yards at Oklahoma in 2020. The potential is off the charts. But wait, there's more. This dude, Zach Evans, transferred in from TCU. He had 650 yards, five touchdowns for the Horned Frogs last year. But I think the big part of his transferring was because 
He was forced to split carries under that system. If he gets, you know, 90, 80, 90% of the carries, this is a thousand yard rusher, I think, for sure. This team really reminds me of what USC has done. You know, bring in a bunch of transfer kind of mercenary pieces on offense uh, and not really improve much uh, on a bad defense from 2021. The returning strength on this side of the ball is in the secondary. Otis Reese and A.J. Finley at strong safety and free safety are among four returning starters in this group. Reese and Finley both had over 90 tackles, and Finley had three interceptions a year ago. Now, Iowa State safety, Ish Young, transferred in as well. He went for 55 tackles, two interceptions in 2021. His, his D-line, though, was really bad in 2021. They gave up almost 200 yards rushing per game and averaged less than one sack per game. Now, I mean, all four starters are back, so, I mean, I suppose they should be a bit better, but it's a real weakness for this uh, defensive side of the ball. And behind them, lest, lest I not continue to uh, depress you Ole Miss fans, behind them, the, in the linebacking group, they have lost a ton in Chance Campbell and Sam Williams, who both went pro. How big is that hole, you might ask? 166 tackles and 18 and a half sacks. Now, I think like with Heupel at Tennessee, I mean, Kiffin definitely has this program headed in the right direction, but <clears throat> we're going to see this year how they handle kind of mass turnover. Uh, you know, which every perennial top 15 team has to deal with. The Rebels do have one of the weaker schedules in the conference. I think they'll pretty easily get out to a 4-0 start. And, and I mean, that might be all the time they need to get this offense firing on all cylinders. I think they'll win the next four as well. Uh, but these last four games are, man, a real grind. I think the Egg Bowl could really be pretty special this year. Uh, this could certainly be another 10-2 season for Ole Miss. Now on to Arkansas, the best division in the country has another team in the top 25 talent rankings, and that's these Razorbacks. Returning starting quarterback K.J. Jefferson passed for almost 2,700 yards and 21 tackles, and he ran for another 664 yards and six touchdowns. You know, when you think of this guy, think like Dak Prescott at Mississippi State. Uh, in front of him on the O-line, you return all five starters, two of which your uh, center, Ricky Stromberg, and your left guard, Brady Latham, are both our first and second team, all SEC respectively. You, you did lose your best running back in Traylon Smith to University of Texas San Antonio, but in steps the sophomore stud, Raheem Sanders. He had almost 600 yards and five touchdowns last year. Now, you also did lose your 1,000-yard receiver, Traylon Burks. He went pro uh, and... Outside of Warren Thompson, the cover is really pretty bare at wideout. So in comes Matt Landers from Georgia, and really kind of the big pickup was Jaden Hazelwood from Oklahoma. This dude went for 400 yards, six touchdowns last year. Now let's talk about the Hogs' defense. They were a top 50 defense in the country in total defense last season, but I think, I think they have improved overall, actually, primarily because of the pickup of Alabama transfer linebacker Drew Sanders, He's going to join one of the best linebackers in the nation, Bumper Poole, who had 125 tackles a year ago. Your next four leading tacklers, though, from last year have all moved on. Only four returning starters, but you have all upperclassmen on the defense. So this is certainly one of the top 25 most talented teams, but this schedule is the most difficult in the nation this year. They play five teams that are currently ranked. 11 of their 12 opponents are ranked in the top 75 in the country. Listen, I think they'll win their first three, but wow. I mean, Texas A&M, Alabama, Mississippi State, and BYU, they could lose their next four. Uh, the back end of the schedule loosens up a bit, though. Maybe somewhere between 6-6 six and six and 8-4 and four for these guys in 2022. Now on to the Mississippi State Bulldogs. One of the biggest gunslingers in college football is back at quarterback for the Bulldogs in Will Rogers. He threw for more than 300 yards in 11 games and over 400 yards in four games last year. <clears throat> the issue, though, was turnovers. Rogers threw nine, nine interceptions, and they had nine fumbles lost as well as a team. You have to value the ball better than that. Now your top two receivers are both gone, and Caleb Ducking moves up to a starting position after just having nine receptions all of last year. 
I think it could take some time for this offense to come along, even though you have such an outstanding weapon in Will Rogers. Now, this defense returns eight starters. Your linebacker, Ty Tyrus Wheat, is back after collecting seven sacks, an interception, and a forced fumble in 2021. And Emmanuel Forbes in the secondary is a second-team All-SEC selection. He had 60 tackles and three interceptions. Now, I mean, the offensive turnovers really put this group in a bind at times last year, but, I mean, they were still a top 30 total defensive unit. Now, going over their schedule, man, right out of the gate, you get Memphis at home. And, I mean, geez, do you remember how they got absolutely robbed in that game last year? I mean, the stadium for this one should be rocking. Uh, but look at how brutal that middle section of the schedule is. Yikes. Really, the game at LSU and hosting Auburn at the end of the season, those will determine if Mississippi State goes bowling. My call here is 6-6. Six and six. I mean, damn, that is a rough schedule. Now, on to the LSU Tigers. And, you know, man, it's so funny. So many Bayou Bengal fans are, like, drawing comparisons from the 2019 offseason and bringing in Joe Burrow and whatnot. And, you know, it's like, whoa, pump the brakes. Like, first of all, Jaden Daniels isn't near the passer that Joe Burrow was. Daniels is good, though. Uh, and he'll be replacing Max Johnson, who transferred to Texas A&M in the offseason. Uh, Daniels came from Arizona State, where he threw for 2,380 yards. But get this. He had 10 touchdown passes and 10 interceptions. He was sacked 33 times. That I mean, that isn't something athleticism can make up for. That's just really poor decision-making. This offense returns just 54%. I mean, this is this is not going to be a good offense to watch. But let's talk about the one great player on this offense. First team, all SEC wide receiver, Kayshawn Boutte. Pro Football Focus has this dude projected the seventh overall pick in next year's NFL draft. He is an absolute stud in the open field, uh, but <clears throat> especially at the wide receiver position. I mean, you can't move the needle much if the quarterback can't get you the ball, right? I mean, anyways. This defense will be the better side of the ball. Up front, Jack Edge, B.J. Ojulari uh, is a first-team All-SEC selection as well. Dude had seven sacks on the year last year. Uh, the D-line also has two other returning starters. But in the linebacking group, replacing All-SEC Damon Clark is going to be really tough. In the secondary, there's a lot unknown. I mean, LSU was crazy active in the portal, building out this squad in the offseason. You have five new starters, all came by way of the transfer portal. A pair of defensive backs came in from Arkansas in Brooks and Faucha, uh, who, who are both good, serviceable players. Um, but the big pickup is corner Jarek Bernard Converse, who had 11 pass deflections on that really good Oklahoma State defense last year. You know, it's, it's year one for Brian Kelly, and expectations are sky high. I mean, they could start the season off 4-0, but, but then who do you beat? Right at that point, look at the schedule. I mean, I have UAB as one of the best group of five teams. Uh, you know, it's not a guaranteed win at home. Uh, UAB. I mean, six and six is the absolute ceiling this year. But I don't even know. I don't even know if they're going to make a bowl game. And finally, the Auburn Tigers. And I mean, man, it's it's crazy to think about. But uh, as Brian Harson enters year two, he is firmly on the hot seat. I mean, you know, he is on a $6 million contract, and, you know, to be honest, I really don't know what he's doing here. Uh, you have some pieces for sure. I mean, first-team all-conference running back, Tank Bigsby, who had 1,100 yards, 10 touchdowns in 2021, but but Calzada was the move at quarterback? Zach Calzada? I mean, <clears throat> or Auburn is, is eating scraps off of Texas A&M's plate now? I mean, is that where the program's at? Um, this is a very senior group, though. I, I guess it's just going to be kind of lean on Bigsby. Now, on the defense, there's a little more stability. The D-line will be the headline. Edge Derek Hall is a first-team All-SEC, uh, having gotten nine sacks and two forced fumbles in 2021. The other end, Colby Wooten, Wooten uh, is second team. He had five sacks as well. Uh, but in your back seven, you're starting three sophomores. Your two best linebackers, Wooten and McLean, both went pro as well as stud safety smoke Monday. I mean, there's a lot of questions on this team. Now, how about their schedule? Well, two wins. You know, they, they, they really need to beat Penn State, 
Missouri and LSU at home uh, because, I mean, there's maybe only one other win in the last seven games. So, whew, we made it. We've covered every conference in college football. I feel like we've laid out the red carpet to get you prepped and ready for the start of the season. Let's go ahead and close out this episode by uh, previewing some of the bigger primetime games in the first two weeks of the season out of the SEC. And right out of the gate, the big primetime game, number 11, Oregon, at number three, Georgia. That's on Saturday, September 3rd. Uh, You also then have on that same day, number 23, Cincinnati, travels to Arkansas. And then number seven, Utah, travels to Florida. Now, thinking of this, coming at this from like a Pac-12 perspective, you don't need Oregon to beat Georgia, but Utah cannot lose to Florida. I mean, if Utah loses to Florida, Pac-12 is irrelevant for the entire rest of the season. Um, So, anyways, that's just sort of my digression there. How about that next Saturday? You have that big game that everybody's pumping up, Alabama at Texas. I mean, I think Alabama's probably going to blow them out, but the better game, I think, on that day is this next game, Saturday, September 10th, Tennessee at Pittsburgh. I think these are two teams that are way underrated. I think they're both very, very good. I already told you I predicted Pittsburgh to win the Atlantic Coast Conference. And I think Tennessee, I was just saying in this preview, I mean, Tennessee has the capability to knock off Alabama. I mean, they could beat anybody um, if they get up for it. So anyways, I appreciate you sticking through this long episode. Thanks so much for the support. I really appreciate it. Uh, as always, send me your feedback at right on QCS on Twitter, right on QCS at gmail.com. College football starts tomorrow. You have been watching right on Q College Sports. I am your host, Tyson Quiller. And we will get at you next time.